Rebecca Stay um, has graduated from Oberlin College with a double degree in Judaic and Near Eastern Studies and Religion, with additional years of study in Hebrew Bible and Rabbinical Midrash at the Laura and Alvin Siegel College of Judaic Studies, now part of the Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. Stay and her husband, Randall, served two missions directing LDS Charities Humanitarian Aid and Refugee Aid in the Europe area. Rebecca taught early morning seminary and institute classes for 35 years in Michigan, Ohio, and Germany. She taught at the Orem Institute and various stakes in Utah through BYU Continuing Education. And Rebecca Stay is a mother of six children and has 19 hilarious grandchildren. So Rebecca Stay, we look forward to your presentation. I'm going to present not necessarily a uh, paper about you know, details from all different kinds of texts, but rather how we in teaching the gospel should pay more attention to what the scriptures actually say. And so we're going to look at a method of teaching um, from Genesis chapters two through four, teaching our children, teaching investigators, teaching in a temple prep situation. And so uh, our sponsor, religious education, may be more of my focus. Uh, to begin, I'd like to quote from Elder Marvin J. Ashton. Uh, I think some of you are old enough to remember Elder Ashton in his October conference address from 1990. He quotes from Doctrine and Covenants, chapter, uh, section 52, verse 14. I will give you a pattern in all things that ye may not be deceived. Satan's established pattern is to deceive at all costs. He would have us forget that the essential thing in life is steadfast commitments to righteous patterns. If we want people to um, adhere closely to a righteous pattern, it would probably be helpful to teach them the pattern. In Genesis 2 through 4, the story of Eden and Adam and Eve, where Satan is trying to deceive them, you see the connection with Marvin J. Ashton, there's an interesting word used repeatedly that is not really necessary to the text. And ever since reading the Book of Mormon, where they talk about how difficult it is to write, um, unnecessary words become more interesting. And one of the words that is not necessary, really, is the word east, at least in the story. Uh, it's as we move that, that um, what it said was, uh, sorry, I have to get the papers correct here. The Lord planted a garden, this is Genesis 2 verse 8, the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And my question was, east of what? And why does it matter? So uh, being raised in the family that I was, where maps were important, I decided to draw a map, since east is a map direction, and I drew a box representing the Garden of Eden, and then said, what is east of it? Um, so in order to consider that, um, and, and the word in Hebrew is kedem, for east, which we'll see over and over, um, mikdem or kedem, either of those variants. We see it, the word next uh, in chapter three, but, sorry, can't tell which side I'm looking at there. I drew a box that is west of Eden that would be to indicate where God was when he planted the garden eastward. And then I asked the question, well, where was God when he planted the garden in Eden? And unfortunately, our current version of Genesis doesn't say much about that. But we do have uh, the wonderful book of Abraham, which we've referred to already. And in the book of Abraham, 
uh, we get a description of where God was. And that was supposed to be there. But let me just read it to you, where God was. This is from uh, Abraham chapter 3, starting about verse 21. I, God, dwell in the midst of them all. I came down in the beginning in the midst of the intelligences which thou hast seen. Now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among these there were many of the great and noble ones. God saw these souls that they were good and he stood in the midst of them and he said, these I will make my rulers. For he stood among those that were spirits and he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou wast chosen before thou wast born and there was one, there stood one among them that was like unto God. And he said unto those that were with him, we will go down for there is space there, and we will take of these materials and make an earth whereon these may dwell. So that's what the box to the west represents, is not only the presence of God, but also the presence of um, innumerable intelligences, and some who are now already in that time period like God. The next appearance of uh, the word east, actually another appearance of the word east, comes in Genesis chapter 3, which is in the story about the woman. Now, in the Genesis account, she has no name until about verse 21. It's not until after she has partaken the fruit that Eve gets a name. And it is the woman who's interested in the trees. Uh, this should not surprise us, because in Genesis 1, which I usually teach prior to teaching 2 through 4, Moses had already associated trees with women. The, Second creation on the third day was to create grass and herbs which bear seed and trees which bear fruit. And that gets paralleled with the second creation on the sixth day, which is males, and that's the term used, the sexual term, males who bear seed and females, nekeba, who bear fruit. So from Genesis 1, women are associated with trees. Um, in order to bear fruit, the woman needs knowledge, an idiom in Hebrew. Uh, we will see it in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, where it says, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. And so Eve, uh, the woman, is asking questions about how how do I get this knowledge? And the tree of knowledge of good and evil is before her. There will be ser serious consequences for both uh, the woman and for Adam in partaking of that fruit. Not all of the consequences are going to be bad, however. One result of eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is this, and this is from Genesis chapter 3. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. So partaking of the fruit leads to um, another, this other use of the word east, where it says, Now lest the man put forth his hand and partake of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. You'll notice that's a commentary on the creation of Adam, where he is made out of the ground, Adama. I hope you also notice that it is all masculine singular in these sentences and verbs. It doesn't say they were driven out. It says he 
which is something we need to think about. So he drove out the man, and he placed on the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep or guard, Shomer, the way of the tree of life. The Lord God then expels the man. Let's go on to the next. And um, to illustrate that eastward movement as they're going out of the garden, I chose to think about the east gate of Yellowstone. That when you go out the east gate towards Cody, you're headed east. And that's the direction. That's where he puts the guards. And therefore, that's the door out. So I drew two circles to represent the cherubim, which, thank you, in the King James Version is a double plural, right? Cherubims. I always cringe at that one. Um, placing the guards here implies that's the direction that Adam and Eve traveled as they left the garden. One of the consequences of eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is, of course, the ability to then bear fruit, to have children, to get knowledge. And that brings up the rest of the story, which is in, in chapter 4, which is about Cain and Abel. We have a problem that there are unspoken assumptions in this story. If Cain and Abel are offering sacrifice on an altar, it might be safe to assume that their parents, Adam and Eve, had themselves built an altar and offered sacrifice, even though it does not say that in the Genesis text. It's conflict at that altar that becomes the focus of the next part of the story. And so I drew an altar, knowing that that's going to be the, the focus of the Cain and Abel portion. Um, at the altar, Cain and Abel will both offer offerings. Cain offers the first fruits of his grain. Abel offers the first fruits of the flock. Now, both of those are acceptable temple offerings if we're going to look at an altar. And thus, it may not be the offerings that were inappropriate so much as the motivation. And we have those great um, lines in the book of Moses to talk about what Cain's motivations are. The Lord then rejects Cain's offering. He gets angry. He kills his brother which prompts the Lord to ask him, where is your brother? What have you done? We may safely assume that the Lord knows exactly what has happened and what's, what, what Cain has done. And thus, perhaps the Lord is offering Cain the opportunity to confess, reconsider, and perhaps repent. But, as the story is told, um, Cain uh, complains and whines about how everybody's going to be mean to him now because his brother is dead. He might have considered that before killing his brother. And God then, or the Lord, uh, places a protective mark on Cain to keep him alive. If we're going to talk about the mark of Cain, we might discuss why it was given. It was to keep him alive. Cain rejects God's outreach, and instead of repenting and returning to fellowship with the Lord, he then went out of the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, which is on the east of Eden. So there we get another movement eastward. Now, there's some significant language there. It says that by moving eastward, away from Eden, away from the altar, um, he is walking out of the presence of the Lord. 
And so I drew a box around those areas that are westward to say that indicates the presence of the Lord that Cain has now left. And at this point, I'm sure this group would easily answer, what have we drawn? What is the story of Adam and Eve a map or pattern of? Um, it's clearly the biblical temple. Very simplified, but as we look more closely at the details, the furnishings, the utensils in the temple, and how they relate to the story of Adam and Eve, we begin to uncover perhaps some of the more important messages uh, of this story. And it's my belief that the reason that the text is edited as it is, perhaps by Moses, uh, he is the traditional author, or we would say redactor or editor of the book of Genesis, uh, since he didn't live at any time during the book. I believe that what he has done is in mercy, he hands to all of the nation of Israel a temple that they may enter through the text. They have rejected entering into God's presence, coming up on the mountain at Sinai. They say, no, you go do it for us. But Moses wants them each to make this ascent. And so he gives them a story, a portable sanctuary, uh, to travel with God's people. Um, as we go back and superimpose the um, story of Adam and Eve back onto the temple. Let's go back to the furnishings here. Um, I'd like to talk about a couple of things. One is the Holy of Holies, which is the room farthest west where the story began, where God was, represents the throne of God, his home, and the pre-mortal existence of intelligences or humans. Uh, that is where Adam and Eve and all the other spirits were when God presented a plan, thank you, Book of Abraham, through which the spirits would be born into physical bodies and thus become more like God. The veil separating the Holy of Holies from the holy space thus becomes a representative of the door through which we pass as we leave God's presence and come into the world. Thus the veil can be seen as birth. And the place that they come into, the holy place, is where Adam and Eve are placed after their births, which are carefully described in Genesis 2. They are um, innocent, they are naked and not ashamed. They run around and there's food for the taking. I hope you can see some symbols there. The, the menorah, which is there in that garden space, represents, in my mind, both trees since both are essential to the plan. The showbread table um, shows the ability to um, have food available without any labor. The altar of incense represents prayer, perhaps showing the con continual conversation between God and his, um, his people. The woman seeking to become wise, which the serpent helps her out with, chooses to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and offers that fruit to Adam. It's only then that she gets the name Eve, which in Hebrew, Chava, is a feminine form of the verb to, uh, to be, to live, so it's life. The plural you all know, which is Chaim, to life, to life, L'chaim. 
So she is named um, life itself. She is the source of life. Later in scripture, um, righteous women are also called wisdom, who is a tree of life to her husband. That's Proverbs that we've heard quoted earlier, Proverbs chapter three. Um, death, of course, is the a consequence of partaking of the fruit and it's immediate, not for Adam and Eve, but certainly for some animals, because they will then be clothed in, in coats of skins to cover their nakedness. Uh, sometime I'm gonna write a paper on that clothing, uh, just the, the insights that come from the word ketonet, which is the description of the coat of skins that they are given. Um, having partaken, of the fruit, Adam and Eve come out of the garden. Um, and in the outer court, they build an altar of sacrifice, and you can see it there. Um, the sacrifices are washed, and the priests who perform them are also kept clean by the water in the laver that is there in the courtyard. Uh, Adam, as we know from the book of Moses, gets baptized. And so, the concept of baptism is immediately connected with men um, as they are encouraged to baptize their children when they reach the age of accountability. We can assume that Cain and Abel not only were taught, at least as much as Adam and Eve knew, um, one of my sons was a little annoyed with me for not having taught him better when he left on his mission. And I said, I taught you everything I knew at the time. I've just learned a lot more since then. Once the kids got in school, I had a little more time to study. Um, so we would assume that Cain and Abel have actually been ordained to priesthood, or they would not have been able to put all um, offerings on an altar and have it acceptable to God. I guess I want to still go back. What I have not really pointed out or talked about is the symbolism of the veil and birth. That the veil represents um, Eve's job, which is to give birth to the children. As, as we talk about the straight and narrow path that the priests are going to follow back in through this temple, um, I, I get a little worried that we forget about the very first ordinance that got us on that path, and that was birth. That was a choice we made. Um, Alma 13 talks about a preparatory atonement that was made for us in the preexistence, that we would have the privilege of receiving priesthood in this life. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember the old family group sheets where we used to write born in the covenant. And I think that we need to resurrect that term as birth is really the first step on the covenant path. It's as we leave um, the garden that we make more covenants. I hope you can see that the garden represents the period in our lives which is childhood. And we get some really wonderful um, interpretations of, of this metaphor, this imagery in the book of Moses, where it's describing Enoch's endowment as he is walked through the Adam and Eve story. And quoting from that, this is all in Moses chapter five. Um, yeah. God hath made known unto our fathers that all men must repent. He called upon our father Adam by his own voice, saying, I am God, I made the world, and men before they were in the world. And he said unto him, If thou wilt turn unto me, and hearken to my voice, and believe and repent of thy transgressions, and that's the language that we heard from uh, Dr. Bradshaw, the term to repent, which is shuv, which is turn around, 
the basis for the Hebrew word repentance, tshuva. Um, see, in the story, Cain doesn't do that. He continues east. The, the message of the story is, don't be like Cain. Don't be the prodigal son who leaves the presence of his father, who leaves the family home and goes eastward out of the presence of God. You know he's out of the presence of God in the prodigal son because he's eating with the pigs. Not an image that would be in holy uh, property. He needs to turn around as the prodigal son does and come home. We didn't see Enoch or sorry Cain do that. You need to be to turn around and then be baptized in water in the name of mine only begotten who is full of grace and truth. I think I have this written. Yeah. Um, which is the only name given under heaven whereby salvation can come. I'm sure that the students we're teaching have no idea that Jesus literally means salvation. That his, that's what his name means. And so it's the only name whereby you can find salvation because it is the name, it is the word, salvation. You will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Um, our father Adam spake and said, why is it that men must repent and be baptized? The Lord said to Adam, behold, I have forgiven thee thy transgressions in the Garden of Eden. Hence came abroad the saying that the Son of Man hath atoned for original guilt. The sins of parents are not answered upon the heads of their children. They are whole from the foundation of the world. The Lord spoke unto Adam, saying, Inasmuch as thy children are conceived in sin, and I would suggest that that means conceived in a place where sin is present, which is the court of sacrifice, the world we now live in, where death is one of the consequences. And according to Elder Holland, Adam and Eve could not have children in the garden. Even so, as those children begin to grow up, sin conceives in their hearts, and they taste the bitter that they may know to prize the good. And thus it is given to them to know good from evil, and they are agents unto themselves. It is as our children partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they receive that gift of agency and start using it. Normally, when our kids get baptized, which is the next step, we talk about how their sins are washed away. We need to stop doing that because if they've been innocent in the garden, they have no sins. It's now that they're out in the world, they actually, by being baptized, are taking a step farther away from God. Each of us and each of our children are going to sin um, and taste the bitter. But this text from, um, i sorry, I said it was Moses 5, it's Moses 6. Um, this text may be the only place that I know of that commands you twice, God commands you twice to teach this to your children. And what he tells you to say is, by reason of transgression, and I think I have this. Maybe, maybe, no, I don't, I'll read it to you. By reason of transgression cometh the fall, which bringeth death. And inasmuch as you are born into the world by water and blood and the spirit which I have made, birth, ordinance performed by women, and so become of dust a living soul, even so you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water and the spirit and cleansed by blood, even the blood of mine only begotten, which is baptism. Now I say unto you, this is the plan of salvation unto all men through the blood of mine only begotten, who shall come in the meridian of time. Now, there's some very important words there. It's where we see the phrase, plan of salvation, and 
the atonement as in the meridian of time. We'll look at those in a moment. But after you've turned around to go back in to God's presence, as we've talked about before, uh, you need to be washed and anointed and clothed. And um, we don't look at those texts often enough. There is a text in Exodus that we are starting to use more now, um, talking about Aaron and his sons being brought to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. There they are washed with water. You put upon them the holy garments, and you anoint them and sanctify them. When something is sanctified, it is made holy, and everything holy in biblical text belongs inside the temple. The next, the thing that we don't often quote is how women are washed and anointed and clothed. This comes from Ezekiel chapter 16, describing the marriage of Jehovah and the bride Israel, his, his wife. When she's old enough, I washed thee with water. I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee. I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee with embroidered work shod thee with badger skin, girded thee about with fine linen, and covered thee with silk. It goes on to talk about the crown on her head and the jewels. Um, for me, the term badger skin was the clue. Badger skin is only mentioned in one other place in the biblical text, and that's as one of the coverings of the tabernacle. Um, I hope you can see that what is being described here is the clothing of the bride is the clothing of the high priest. He is, he represents the bride. Um, what we want to notice is how this plan has evolved in our writing and picturing it as our um, cultures have changed. In Hebrew, they talk about time as one eternal round. So you leave God's presence, you come out, you turn around, and you go back. There's the circle. Western, more Greek culture is linear. And so we have the great temple that we now have, which is the floor plan of the Salt Lake Temple, uh, which is linear. And it represents our passage through that temple is our passage through life. Uh, let's go, let me just finish with this. Uh, we come from eternity into childhood, partake of the fruit, enter mortality. When we die, we go back into an Edenic place, a paradisiacal place, the spirit world, or the millennium, depending on when you live. From there, we are born again, resurrected, and enter into eternity again in the presence of God. That's the plan, and that is the floor plan of the Salt Lake Temple. The plan of salvation is, as I'm sure you know, a chiastic poem. And it's not just people that walk through it. It is the pattern for the earth itself. As it goes from being in God's presence, moved eastward, it falls at the time of the fall. It will be uh, made new for, for the millennium and then becomes a celestial globe. We're not doing a good job on teaching this pattern. And so my recommendation is that we think more carefully as we teach it because it com becomes a temple prep lesson for people of all ages. We can either depict it as a descent and ascent, we can show it as a going away and coming back like a chiastic poem, or we can look at it with even more detail and say, well, if there's three places in heaven at the end, were there three in the beginning? And we have those who are not in God's presence at the end, we're in outer darkness, and we have those who were sent out of the presence of God in the pre-existence. The plan of salvation is the pattern, and I think that plan, which is not used in the Old Testament, could be replaced with the word pattern, tabinit, which essentially means blueprints of a building, bana being the central folk verb. 
um, is the plan of salvation, the plan about Jesus. So our final looking at this is, did Jesus follow this exact plan? We know he was in the presence of God, the one who is like unto God in the pre-existence. We have seen him talking to Adam and Eve in the garden, and we watch him be born through Mary into that innocent garden. Then he commits a sin like everyone and goes out into the world, right? Well, no. When does Christ partake of the bitter fruit? Well, he tells us. As he is suffering in the garden, and it is so important that we pay attention to where we see Christ in the garden, he um, is suffering, which suffering caused myself the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, bleed at every pore, suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup. What, what did it say in the book of Moses? For taking the bitter fruit. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus partakes of the fruit, experiences the effects of sin, guilt, remorse, pain, and didn't want to do it, but he does. He partook and finished his preparations. And so we find that he followed exactly the same plan within hours of partaking of the fruit, he is the offering on the altar. He then moves into the spirit world on Saturday, where he organizes, it's the garden again, paradisiacal, that's where Adam and Eve are. He gets them organized to do the work for the dead. We next see him still in the garden because he has not been resurrected, has not been born again where he, as the gardener, appears to Mary, who is an Eve figure. And then, Easter Sunday, he returns to the presence of his father. It's my hope that we will think deeply about the patterns in scripture and use scripture to teach our children so that they are prepared for experiences like the temple when they come of age. Thank you. Our modern temples usually face the east, and so the question is, is there record in the ancient, in antiquity that temples in ancient Israel or elsewhere also faced east? Sure. Um, uh, it is described in Kings with the building of the temple. Um, if, and, and the church tries to teach that. If you look at the map that's in the study materials, uh, used to be called the Bible Dictionary, uh, and the map section, they show the orientation of the, church, of the temple to the east so that as the sun rises, which of course is the sun, S-O-N, in his chariot, um, Ezekiel, he comes from the east and enters his house and travels westward. And helping people see that orientation will help them better understand so many other biblical texts. Wonderful. And of course, Salt Lake Temple is oriented that way. Yeah. I think yeah. most of them are, except for a few, like Nauvoo is oriented westward. <laughs> yeah. And Ohio has a little twist because of the piece of land. Sure. <laughs> yeah.